In John's gospel, Jesus proclaims seven I am statements. You know them, but let's hear them again. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. So living bread, light of the world, the sheep gate, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, and the way, the truth, and the life all reflect Jesus' relationship to his disciples. He pledges to them that he will nourish them and guide them and protect them and lead them. And he will endow them with life and true knowledge. Now the image of Jesus as the true vine and all of us as the branches crown the rest of the I am statements. This metaphor goes beyond all that has been said and done before and paints a picture of what he will later pray in his prayer for all. May all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us. Which, by the way, you will find as the motto of the United Church of Christ. We find it in our symbol. By using the image of the vine and the branches, Jesus explains that we are in an intimate, inextricable relationship. We are part of him and we're part of one another. The image of the true vine draws us in to explore the depths of our connection to God in life. It reminds us that whether or not we recognize it, we are dependent on God. At the same time, both the image and Jesus' prayer for unity recognize that it's up to us to play our part. Our life and potential come from God, but we are the ones who choose to bear fruit or to choke ourselves off from the vine. All seven of the I am self descriptions in John's gospel invite us into a much deeper understanding of Christ and ourselves as disciples. We can contemplate the image of the vine like that of the shepherd and the bread of life as God's rationale for creation and the incarnation. Each of the statements describe how God reaches out of creation in love. Each statement invites us to respond to be branches, to be God's flock, to seek God's light, to eat the bread of life, and to know from where our life comes and to return thanks. Now John 15 reminds us that we must be continually choosing to truly show that we are part of this vine. God always offers us options of being fruitful branches receiving and giving divine life. But there is another option. We can choose not to be fruitful. We can choose to be fruitless. That's right. We can choose to be fruitless. We can choose to say nothing, to do nothing, to be nothing, to give nothing, to go nowhere, to ask no questions, to challenge nothing in this world, to do what is just nothing. It's a choice. Here is the irony. The difference between being fruitless and fruitful happens with the pruning of the branches. In the gospel, as well as in the garden, the fruit-bearing branches of the vines are pruned and the fruitless branches are removed. And there's a difference. The word translates pruned from the Greek this way. It means to cleanse, to purge, to purify. The verb is commonly used in inscriptions on ceremonial cleansing, but it's not the normal word for pruning. There's a gardening term for pruning, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He is talking about people rather than vines. To understand what Jesus is saying about people, however, it's important to understand something about vines. In my family, there is one gardener. Susan is the gardener. She knows what she's doing in a garden. 
Well, I uh, carry the tools or perhaps carry the mulch or the dirt or whatever she tells me to carry. She, I am prone to step on the plants that are fruitful or life-giving. She, on the other hand, knows every good plant and every weed. She knows what to nurture and what to pull out of the garden. So in our garden, she tells me what to do and I do it, always with a prayer that I'm not yanking fruitful plants from the earth, even though she has pointed them out to me at least two or three times. <laughs> a number of years ago, and I know some people are thinking this is a metaphor for a lot more, right? <laughs> Mark, stop. A number of years ago, we were pruning the vines on our back fence. She told me how and where to cut them. And when it all seemed to me to be way too severe, I told her, I don't think I can do this, but she kept saying, you can do it. It felt like I was destroying the vines by cutting them down so far that they would die. So being me, the assistant gardener, I grumbled, I questioned, I complained when the branches cut my arms, ow. But as the assistant gardener, I just kept pruning all the while asking God's forgiveness and the plant's forgiveness for destroying the grapevine in my backyard. When I was done, I was absolutely convinced that I had been a part of the butchery of the branches. I couldn't even look at them. I kept asking for their forgiveness. But as the summer wore on and the branches began to grow and bear fruit, I was blown away that life had returned to the once mangled branches of the vines. And I had to admit that Susan was right again. Pruning saved the vines. Now, I believe all of us fail at some level to prune the things in our lives. I know I have an amen out there somewhere. We all have behaviors that need to change. We remain inactive and non-responsive because we're actually afraid to fail, or we're just afraid that when we do something, it will die. Our fears and our anxieties keep us from living and doing more pruning, and thus keep us from living abundantly. So what is it that needs to be pruned in your life? What needs to become fruitful from the fruitlessness of your actions or inactions, your passivity or your passions out of control. I have a list that I have been working on and others could add to my list, I'm sure, but I'm getting my pruning shears out. I'm sharpening them to cut back, to trim away, to deal with the dead, the fruitless branches of my life. And so as I do that, I know it won't be easy, but it's necessary. It's necessary to prune, to cleanse, to purge, to purify in order to get it right and allow for new life to blossom and flourish in my life and the life of my family and community. All of us are faced with the same thing. In the coming weeks and months, we as a church need the renewal that comes from real pruning. As we return to worship and life together in person, we need to figure out what needs to be cut down so that true renewal can happen, so that a flourishing of life and faith can happen. We have to walk carefully in the garden of God. We don't want to crush real life and hope. We don't want to destroy. In the words of the prophet Jeremiah, what must be plucked up should be plucked up and what must be planted will be planted for God to flourish in our life together. So we'll have to figure that out. In our community of Columbus and Central Ohio, we also need to prune the fruit-bearing branches and remove the fruitless branches. As our community laid 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant to rest on Friday after she was shot four times and killed, by a Columbus police officer on April 20th, I found myself weeping about Micaiah and the broken relationships of our police and community. 
which now following the death of 26 citizens, 95% of whom have been black, at the gunpoint of the Columbus police in the last five years, it's at its worst point ever. It is heartbreaking that we are second in the nation in the economic gap between white and black people in Columbus. Cincinnati and Cleveland have had two police shootings and deaths in the past year, and while two is too many, we have had five in the past five months. We are also ahead of Chicago and Los Angeles and Boston for per capita deaths of African Americans by police. We rank 18th out of 100 cities for this statistic, and we have three more such deaths just in the past six weeks. As well, we have had double the number of homicides in the first four months of 2021 over 2020, which, as you may remember, was the worst year for citizens of Columbus killing other citizens of Columbus in the long history of our city. I talked to a friend yesterday who had a funeral for a 15-year-old who had been shot by another 15-year-old from an argument the one is hanging on for dear life and his friend is dead. This has to end. For five months, bread, building responsibility, equality, and dignity has been researching police reform and continuing to press for reforms in gun violence initiatives. We have come up with reality-based, research-based solutions for both the increased deaths that we're seeing in police shootings and other increases in gun violence. These are tried and true initiatives that have worked in other cities and we believe could work here. For 21 years, we have all been members of BREAD. For 21 years, I've invited you to the Nehemiah Action each May. And I believe this year's 2021 Nehemiah Action, which will be held in a parking lot and on Zoom, will be our most important one ever. There are no excuses for each of us for any of us to not drive in or zoom in on Tuesday, May 11th for part or all of the action from 6.45 to 8.30 p.m. We can literally put an earpiece in and listen while cooking our dinners, getting the kids ready for bed, or walking the dogs. You can be, and I believe must be, part of the largest gathering of Jews, Muslims, Christians, anywhere in Ohio working for justice and one of the largest organizations in the nation of faith-filled people seeking change. Let's be part of the solutions to end the spiral of death and violence in our community. I encourage you, no matter who you are or where you are, as you're witnessing and listening today, to go to our links in the Depart to Serve, to our website, or email me, and sign up for the Nehemiah Action now, today. We will get to either a parking spot or a Zoom link, and we will be together to be part of the solution that pulls us out of the madness of gunning down and killing people in our city and region. This is the moment. Let's be a part of turning this around. Let's be a part of pruning the tree and the vine to make it healthy again. As the first letter of John tells us, let us love not in word or in speech, but in deed and in truth. The proof of commitment is not in the words and speech, but deeds and truth of each of us. And we can do it. We can be the change we want to see. Our true vine, Jesus our Savior, is calling each of us to be faithful in our personal lives, in our life together as a community of faith, and as members of the larger Columbus and Central Ohio community, even more as citizens of this great nation crying out for fruitful people to lead loving and fruit-filled lives. To bear no fruit is a choice, but it's not a choice that is designed and guided by the will of God. As we turn this day to God's table of grace, let us remember that for John, belief in Jesus was never an intellectual exercise. Rather, belief was and remains to this day a motivator for all of our life's activities and actions. The true vine which binds us together 
is calling us to prune the branches and produce fruit for our lives, or as Jesus simply said to each one of us in today's gospel, abide in my love. So let's get the pruning shears out. Let's get to work so that we can produce a harvest of love for ourselves and for others. In the name of our true vine. Amen.